So back to the topic at hand, why would anyone be looking at scintillators? Um, and really it is that water equivalence. Um, water equivalence means that we're not perturbing the beam right there at the point of measurement for mega voltage photons and electrons in particular, um, so that as we get into these really complicated small fields where um, the, the energies are changing because of source occlusion or your um, beam penumbra is not well defined by your, your jaw position um, or nominal field sizes, um, that's where that, that water equivalence and that lack of perturbation right there at the point of measurement is so critical. Um, we can make them very small, which is um, nice, again, for um, for looking at those really small fields um, and, and for decreasing the volume averaging that happens over the detector itself. Um, they are dose and dose rate independence in these clinical beams, um, energy independence across that megavoltage range. Um, I'll show you a publication that, um, that has a table of KQ values where KQ for the, the simulator is unity, um, which again reflects that water equivalence. You're, you're not changing the response of the detector as the, the beam quality changes. There is a very small temperature dependence with it. It's about a tenth of a percent per degree, um, but as long as all your measurements are at um, room temperature, QA type measurements, then there, that can be neglected. Um, and there are no uh, metallic components in this fiber, so you can use it with MR Linux as well. The scintillators that we use are organic plastic scintillators. Um, the W1, which is the first generation device, has a one millimeter diameter and three millimeter long active scintillation region. Um, with the W2, there's both one by one and one by three fibers um, available. The Difficulty with scintillators is that you do have to correct for Cherenkov light. So this is essentially a stem effect um, of the, the Cherenkov that is produced within the optical transfer fiber. Um, this is a byproduct of the, um, the energy, the speed of the electrons traveling through that plastic. Um, it's comparable, I, I have the classic picture here of the, the um, reactor coolant pools um, glowing blue. Um, it, it is a, um, a phenomenon that happens when the electrons are tra traveling faster than the speed of light in that particular medium. Um, we use a two-channel chromatic correction. It's based on a publication from Matthew Guyot um, in MedPhysics from 2011. Um, and really, we're um, splitting the light. Well, I guess I have a slide on this next, splitting the light into two different color bands and using the, the change in signal um, in one color band to correct the, the um, primary color band where our simulation signal is. Scintillators uh, do require a reference dose, um, essentially like a daisy chain, if you want output in terms of dose um, on your machine, um, and then periodic recalibration as the plastic acquires dose, um, the fiber with yellow, you'll, you'll change the way the light is filtered as, it trans, as it's transported through the fiber. Um, you'll also decrease your signal somewhat because of that additional filtration. So the, that's why the, um, the periodic recalibration is required. Usually it's about a 2% decrease per kilogray in terms of the signal output. So it, they, they do have um, a reasonably long lifetime. Um, it's just something to be aware of as you're making your measurements. That two channel chromatic correction that I mentioned um, is essentially shown in the, the plot here on the right hand side. Our scintillator um, happens to be a blue uh, scintillator. So the primary output is within that blue region of the spectrum. Um, Cherenkov is a broad spectrum light, so it crosses both what we call the blue channel and the green channel, um, those two color bands that we're looking at. Um, so for characterization measurements, what we're really trying to figure out is what, um, what proportion of the signal in the blue channel is Cherenkov um, using the, the Cherenkov that's in the, the green channel. So we have people make um, measurements with the dose to the tip of the fiber remaining the same um, and changing the amount of optical fiber that's in the field. So we're changing only the Cherenkov contribution. We can look at the 
um, the relative change then in the blue signal channel um, between what we call the maximum fiber configuration and the minimum fiber configuration relative to those same changes that happened in the green channel. And that relative difference, uh, the ratio we call the CLR, which stands for Cherenkov light ratio. So then that CLR value can be saved um, and used to correct subsequent measurements to get rid of that stem effect signal. Um, so that's the equation on the right here that I, in subsequent measurements, your scintillator signal is calculated by taking the blue signal channel, which is this one, and subtracting the Cherenkov light ratio times the green signal. So that's the, the fraction of the signal um, that has to be removed from the blue channel in order to get rid of that Cherenkov. If you would like to do a dose calibration, um, this really ends up being just a scaling factor or a unit conversion multiplied uh, by this corrected value. Um, so you would just, after you calculated your CLR, um, you would put this in a reference condition in a reference field size, in um, a, a um, field where you know the dose output, um, give it a known dose, and then that, that conversion factor can be calculated, and um, the later measurements then can be reported in terms of dose. Our first generation device is called the W1. Um, it has been available since 2014, so there are a fair number of publications. There's a lot of experience with this one, um, eight years on the market now. Um, it does have, as I mentioned, that one millimeter diameter, three millimeter long active area. Um, but the, the neat thing about this, because it's been out for a while, it is part of that TRS-483 publication, which is the, the joint publication from the AAPM and the IAEA on small fields. If you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend it um, for your small field measurements. But the, the thing that, that I love about this publication um, with regards to our scintillators in particular is that every table that our scintillator shows up in um, for all field sizes that are available um, correction factor is unity, um, and these are KQ values. So really does reflect the fact that this is truly water equivalent, and as these energies are changing, as you get down to these really small fields, um, it doesn't affect the output of the scintillator. The drawbacks to the W1, um, as that first generation device, um, it is just a single point measurement system. It was not designed for use um, in a scanning water tank. It, it's waterproof. Um, you can put it in water. That's not a problem at all. But you need to use something like our Supermax that's a two-channel electrometer in order to look at the signal in the blue channel, the signal in the green channel, and perform that Cherenkov subtraction. Um, the Supermax does have a built-in um, scintillator routines that will help walk you through the, the characterization measurements, the dose calibration if you want to, um, and then um, allow you to select that saved file so that it will do that um, Cherenkov correction automatically as you're doing the rest of your measurements. If you're using somebody else's two-channel water or electrometer, some other system that you have, um, you would need to do all of that math on your own. With the W2, um, we took that next step to make it um, a, a little uh, more easily used in a water tank. Um, so it's got not only a user replaceable fiber, you can swap between the one by one fiber and the one by three. Um, the rationale for that really is the one by one gets you the best resolution, um, but it is the lowest signal level. Um, if you have slightly higher signal levels and the one by three works for you, um, that does make your, your um, set up just a little bit easier because you get a bit higher signal to noise. Um, there's also then that tie to all of the publications in, on the um, W1, which is the one by three millimeter simulator. We have a dedicated optics and electronics uh, system called the Max SD um, that, that takes in that optical signal, um, allows you to do point measurements or perform the Cherenkov correction. Um, just there with that one unit, um, but it also will convert the Cherenkov corrected signal into an analog output, an output current um, that can be read out by your water tank um, so that you can gather the data with your water tank scanning system. That setup looks like this. We have um, an adapter sleeve that fits on the W2 um, so that you can hold it in your standard chamber holder for scanning. Um, you would hook up then that optical fiber into the input of the Max SD. 
make sure that you have your CLR file selected. Um, and then the output goes from a triax output here into the input of your scanning electrometer. And then essentially you would treat it just as, as you would scan with a diode. You don't apply bias to it, but when it's irradiated, you the, the water tank receives signal. Um, we have a special jig for use in the water tank um, in a vertical diode holder if you wanted to do the CLR measurements there um, with this minimum fiber and maximum fiber configuration setups. Otherwise, um, you can use a rectangular field as well and rotate your collimator just using the, the W2 in the, the scanning setup like this or point measurement setup. A little bit of data just for fun on this. Um, there's a publication, I guess it's three years old now, um, from Paulina Galavis um, at, at NYU Langone um, when the W2 was first coming out. And the, really the comparison was, has anything changed from the W1? Um, which it hadn't. It's the same fiber. It's the same sort of correction to, um, method that we were using. Um, so none of that was a surprise that, that it still didn't show dose rate dependence or dose dependencies. Um, but the fun part to me on that publication is the, the proof of uh, proofs in the pudding, right? The, the proof that actually scanning with the W2 overlaying those values with the, the film for, in this case, a, a, a one centimeter field. Um, really does give you excellent results. Another publication um, from Jesse Snyder, uh, this is Richard Popple's group at um, University of Alabama at Birmingham. We're looking at um, patient targets uh, with the Varian HyperArc system, um, but looking at targets down to a three millimeter diameter, diameter target which was the smallest one they evaluated, and got excellent agreement, again, between their film measurements and the point measurements that they were making with the W2. Um, on the, on the right-hand side, this is the chamber plug for um, our lung phantom, and you can see um, the W2 doesn't show up very well. That water equivalence does come back to bite you once in a while. You can't find it on the images nearly so well. Um, so we do provide a localization um, fiber, a, a dummy fiber with a BB at the, the center of the active area of the simulator. Um, so you can use that if you're doing phantom measurements or imaging alignment to the tip of the fiber um, to be able to, to locate where you should make your QA plan to um, or, or where you're actually measuring as you're um, using these phantom measurements. Well, thank you once again for your attention, everyone. Um, I'm going to close the webinar, but definitely please feel free to follow up with us if you think of anything else.